I fall flat on my face tonight, I've got a built-in excuse, don't I? Sinus and allergies, sometimes rage. I might as well get this by me. There's not a hesitant bone in my body. I don't hesitate at all. There's my five grandkids. That's <laughs> what you call coming prepared. I may not have as many as this good sister does, but I've got five that's almost as if valuable in my mind by all means. I do not want to in any way make this as a commercialization. I said something to Brother Maxey about it. Maybe to lay the foundation by saying at 20 some odd years of age in 1969, Bader Gymnasium, Fried Hardeman University, Andrew Conley spoke that night on overcoming mediocrity. My life was changed as a result of that lesson. I went in a preacher, I came out a worker. And I'm not trying to brag, I'm just merely saying he touched my life. Brother Andrew is gone. So is Bill Jackson. So is Foy Wallace, and Bobby Duncan, and Guy Woods. And some of those men, I do not want to see their influence cease. And I pray that by our efforts, we can accomplish that. These students that are enrolled here at this school, as well as in various other places, did not have the opportunity of maybe sitting at their feet. But I'd like to see that accomplished. There are some good people at the East Hill Church in Pulaski that have kind of worked with me and we have taken a lot of their sermons and digitized 40-year-old tapes, 30-year-old tapes, and now have them on CDs that'll play in your home, in your car. There are 10 of them all together that tell a little bit about these 12 sermons by eight ones. We've picked a couple of men that are not only still alive, but powerful, great, and influential men. Dave Miller's one of those. Jimmy Clark, another one of those, that are on each set. There's 10 CDs in a set. Ed Allen will be over here on the front pew. If you have any interest, that's wonderful. They're $25 for the 10 CDs, a couple of dollars plus each. As I said, not a commercialization. If you know what CDs cost, you know that's not much more than just what we're trying to do in getting the message out. Overcoming Mediocrity is one of those by Andrew Conley. Will God always bless America is another one. And Persecutors of the Faith is a third one by Andrew Conley on this first set. I challenge you, I plead with you to not only get them, but also listen to them. And I promise you as a result, it'll change your life. Because if you'll listen to the things that are said, it truly will draw you closer to God and make you likewise a worker in His kingdom. Allow me to say I'm honored again to be here. I love this church. So many of you and I have talked together throughout the year, but I look forward to this time of the year. And truly, even if we were not as a participant, as speaking, I would do everything I could to be attending here. And I regret this year that it was not possible for me to be here earlier. I was the loser. And I know that your cup has been filled and overflowing, and I'm thankful truly for this great series. How appropriate it is for us to look at softly and tenderly as the last song that we shall study and exhaustively look at or seek to do so in this series. The man's name is Will Thompson, died in 1909, born in 1849. He wrote additional songs such as, Lead Me Gently Home, Jesus is All the World to Me, and There's a Great Day Coming. Various other ones to which we're quite familiar. But this one tonight is going to have some words that no doubt all of us could quote and could sing without the aid of a, a songbook. But I hope to dissect the song, maybe as others have done, and look at the individual phrase and draw out of it a little bit that will apply to our lives and maybe 
tweak your hearts tonight if you're not a Christian to obey the Lord and become a Christian, a child of His, or if you're erring in the sight of God to come back home, if you're a faithful child of God to keep on working and to more passionately and more fervently go about reaching others, talking to others, extending to others that gospel clarion call that can be eternity determining if we will have the aggressiveness, the love within our hearts of initiating the conversation with our friends, our family, our neighbors, our co-workers, whoever and wherever we have the opportunity of doing so. May I suggest from the very beginning, just imagine someone knocking at your door. You're home at nighttime, maybe watching television, maybe reading a book, whatever it may be, and the door knock comes to your ear and you just sit there and ignore it. Say, oh, it's just probably a salesman. And it may be. But in this case, let's suppose that it's someone that is going to bring you a large check. We see on television at time, Publisher's Clearinghouse, that $10 million check glaring before our eyes, and we're drooling, as it were. Just suppose that it was that. Or if you can, even suppose that it's even more than that. Greater riches being offered than even millions of dollars. And you knew it. Would you just sit there and continue reading, watching television? Would you dare just kind of ignore and walk away or go on to bed at the, at the close of a day? I dare say not. And yet, knocking at the door of our heart is one that has riches far greater than millions of dollars, gold and silver, the greatest accolades, the greatest type of awards that could ever be given. Jesus, the Christ, invites, encourages, pleads with, stands waiting for you, as it were, to open the door and for you to receive the gift. Oh, there's things that must be done. You must accept, you must receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul, James 1. You must submit doing the will of the Father, Matthew chapter 7. You must obey Him, Hebrews 5, verse 8 and 9. You must be willing to conform your will to His will. But upon doing so, the riches that we have truly beyond the greatest imaginations of what we might receive for this brief sojourn in this life. Listen to the words of the song as we dissect it. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Tenderly does not indicate weakness, does not indicate the idea of a soft, namby-pamby sort of individual, but rather the Savior, though tender and meek and other attributes that we could enumerate. He was one of strength and aggressiveness at different times, overturning the, money, the table of the money changers, hanging on the cross for as long as he did, enduring and willingly accepting, even as it were, the Roman soldiers pounding the nails into his body. And yet in that strength, the Savior softly and tenderly looks at you as it were, comes to you in your heart and says, come to me. Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. Whosoever will, let him drink of the water of life. Revelation 22. Jesus says, indeed, here is the way that leads to that place of rest, that eternal home, the city that is prepared, the mansion, the home of the soul. And it can be yours. And he softly and tenderly calls. Is it not because he knows? 
He knows the value of your soul. He knows worth more than the whole world, he stated, as recorded in Matthew chapter 16, 24 through 26. He knows the horror of sin. He knows the consequences, the price that must be paid for sin. He understands and fully realizes that there's only two choices as far as eternal abodes for your soul after your brief sojourn on this earth. You'll be here but just for a short time. Life is as a vapor, James says in James chapter 4. And after our brief sojourn here, either heaven or eternal torment, hell awaits us. Jesus knows that. He pictured it before our mind's eye so emphatically in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate, or the, the narrow way, the broad way. One leads to life, one leads to eternal torment. Few find that narrow way that leads to life. Many there be that go in thereat, that goes the broad way, that leads to destruction. Jesus knows that there is coming a time in which we shall be judged a fair, just, righteous judgment. We, may, we sometimes make mistakes. Judges and juries make mistakes. God will not make a mistake. It'll be fair and righteous, but judgment is coming to us all. In Hebrews 9 and verse 27, it's appointed that a man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. Jesus knows that. He's taught us that. He relies upon that. He'll be there, the judge. And thus able to look not only into the eyes of those who lived on earth at the time that he walked on this rotating ball, but look down through the times of history and as it were, look into your eyes as we read his inspired, declared, precious, flawless word. And as we hear him say, come and I'll give you rest softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Calling. Call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And a lot of people misunderstand that we're not talking about it in that particular perspective. But rather, as Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 indicate, the idea of being called out of darkness and translated into the marvelous light, the King of His dear Son. As we can go to the Holy Scriptures again and again, we're called into one body, Colossians 3, 15, by the gospel of Jesus Christ, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14. We're called into that marvelous light, a chosen generation, 1 Peter chapter 2, 9 and following. Calling. You see, he sees us in the world. He doesn't want the world in us. If the world or sin is in us, we cannot enter into that heavenly home. Nothing that defileth can enter in there. So he calls based upon that which God has done already to make it possible for you to be saved. God gave his son. The son gave his life, shed his blood. Without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sins. Hebrews chapter 9. But with the price having been paid, the ransom has been paid, the propitiation for our sins as it were. And as a result, we now can be the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. 1 John chapter 2, the first couple of three verses and on into the, second, uh, the third chapter. We truly are called out of the world and made possible that we can be children of God Heirs of, Christ, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. The first verse continues of this song. See, on the portals, he's waiting and watching. Portals is not a word that we use all the time. It means very simply doorway or entrance. The picture is very clearly portrayed in our minds when I read in John chapter 14, John's account of the gospel when Jesus said, that recorded by John, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. He's gone to prepare that place. 
and I can almost in my mind's eye as enticing words and thoughts see him, as it were, beckoning with outstretched arms, pleading, as it were, saying to you, follow me, do my will, walk in the righteous way, prepare for that glorious home. It'll all be worth it one day. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Romans 8. He said, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not to be compared with the glory that is to come. That mansion, that home of the soul. He's calling us. He's beckoning us as, as, as it were, standing at the entrance, the doorway, as the image is portrayed in our minds, waiting and watching. When I can read in Luke chapter 15 concerning the angels that rejoice over one that is returned to faithful service, one that is now righteous in the sight of God, is it any stretch then to say that truly there is that awareness not only of angels, but of those that are there as they look, as they anticipate, and certainly as the Son of God? He so tenderly, softly calling us, calling you and me. Second verse. Let's see, that was 17 minutes time four. That's not going to be too bad, is it? If Dave can get away with it, I can too. Why? Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading? Is, if there ever was a question that could not be sensibly and logically answered, that would be it. If someone walked up to you and offered you that 10 million, you wouldn't hesitate logically if you understood if you truly had the facts clear in your mind, if you understood, as it were, the priorities and, and the understanding of the... But our Savior has told us. He's told us about that place where there's no death, no crying, no sorrow, no pain. He's told us about the eternality of it. He's told us who will be there. He's told us of certain images and glimpses that we have of this great and wonderful place, that truly, why should we tarry and heed not his mercy? He's pleading. Why should we linger when the mercies of God so graciously has been extended? Undeservedly so. It would have been righteous, maybe. It would have been understandable, truly, if God had turned his back on us and just walked away. We could not have argued. There would have been no legitimate reason that we could have given, saying, oh, oh no, wait a minute, you owe this to it. He owes us nothing. He made such and such available blessings on top of blessing, offer on top of offer. God, who at sundry time and divers manner spoken times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days all of the ways of the history of man. He's come to man, he's come to man, and my man has cycled coming to God, asking for God, pleading with God to forgive, and God would forgive and extend blessings, and then man fall away in such a short time thereafter, forgetting all that had gone before, and then it would be a matter of pleading again for God, please forgive, please forgive, please restore, and God in his mercy would do just that, and again man would fall away. And here we are. Look at our world today and truly, would it not be a correct statement to say and how our world compares, as it were, of that image that we have of the world at the time of Noah when it made God sorrowful that He had even created man? Are we any better? Do conditions exist that are so different? And yet he has extended grace and mercy. Oh, what a wonderful God. What an awesome Father. What love. What long-suffering. But I must add, it is not endless. There's coming that time when he'll draw the line, as it were, figuratively, in the sand, saying enough is enough. He did that with the people of Noah's day. And there's coming that time when the day of the Lord as a thief in the night and it'll all be over until that moment 
softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling. Mercy is extended. Grace is available. Third verse. Time is now fleeting. The moments are passing. Passing from you and from me. If you tell her I said so, I'll deny it. The only reason she didn't come tonight is because today was her birthday. She doesn't like birthdays anymore. I, I just threw that in. That didn't cost you anything. Birthdays pass so fast, don't they? Oh, when I was 15 and you had to be 16 to get driver's license, that was about 15 years long, that one last year. But now they come every 30 days, it seems. I'm really not only joking. Time flies by, doesn't it? It's hard to imagine that a man with such energy as Brother Perry Cotham, 90 years of age just a few days ago, a servant of the Lord for so many years, he preached the first gospel sermon at the East Hill Church 50 years ago this year. Time is passing we can enumerate those that are gone on. Our hearts hurt and ache when we think about those that have just departed in the last 12 to 24 months of our co-workers, our associates, those that have encouraged us and strengthened us so much. But to your heart, I can say, with all assurance that the likelihood of our coming back together, all of us still being alive, let's even say 30 days from now, is very unlikely. Certainly not next year. If we follow the pattern at all. And I can just imagine maybe some of the younger ones sitting around thinking, well, yeah, look at them. There, there's some old people here. I mean, they're definitely going to be gone by that time. But death is not just for the old. I think I've told you before about Joel. I think I've told you before about Mark. One was 18, one was 19. An accident took both of them, suddenly, abruptly, ending their lives. I can tell you about Wilson, one of our members. I can tell you about Dr. Hart, one of my elders, 60 years of age getting ready for church on Sunday morning. And he died instantly. Folks, we're all facing that absolute certainty. Death is coming. Time is fleeting. The moments are passing. Shadows are gathering. Deathbeds are coming. Am I trying to come at you emotionally? Am I trying to upset you? I'm not trying to get you to do something that you otherwise should not do, but if I can picture before your mind's eye the fact that you have no assurance of waking up to another day, you have no promise of next month or next year. And we have just this short little brief, what seems to be a short vapor of a life on earth to prepare for eternity. And thus, rightfully so, we emphasize softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Why? In view of death. The certainty that is coming, the uncertainty as to when. My heart breaks every time I think about it. I've told you about it, some of you. Maybe some of you were not here but that little six-year-old girl that was riding in that go-kart that Friday afternoon that LaDonna and I drove up on and saw that little precious body, and it was so crushed. I can only imagine what the mom and dad, they never had a clue. They never thought at the beginning of that day that their little precious six-year-old Ashley was going to be dead before the day was over. When LaDon and I put our first child to bed that Tuesday afternoon, at the ripe old age of six weeks old, not a thought that went through our minds that she'd die that afternoon. 
It can happen to the six weeks, the six years, the sixteens, or the nineties. At a funeral service the other day for a hundred and two precious year old faithful child of God that served our Lord unbelievable amount of years. Death beds are coming. Fourth verse. Oh, for the wonderful love he has promised. Promised for you and for me. Of all the things that we cannot begin to stretch our minds and encapsulate the, the entirety, the overall love of God, the love of the Savior. Our minds can go to Calvary. We can try again and again. We can imagine what it was to have received the stripes that made his literal flesh as ribbons flowing with blood. We can imagine what it was to have the nails, the old rough, jagged nails hammered into his body. We can imagine what it was, as it were, the lifting of it up and the, and the sickening thud that it was when it was dropped, as it were, where the weight of his whole body sagged on those nails. We can imagine what it was to have been there an hour, two hours, three, four. When the truth of the matter is, he could have called 10,000 angels. He could have destroyed the world. He could have annihilated the enemy. And it wasn't the nails that held him there. Oh, for the wonderful love of the Savior, the Son of God to pay the price, not that he owed, not for crimes that he had committed, but for that which we, our sins and our transgressions, as it were, were on his shoulders, of the whole world, to make it possible to extend to you, come and I'll give you rest. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon. All have sinned, Romans 3, 23. The transgression of sin, the price that we have to pay for it, the consequence is death, Romans 6, 23. Nothing that defileth can enter in according to Revelation 22. But listen to the latter part when it says, though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon. He offers the blotting out. Not to recall, recapture, hold against us at some time in the future. But to blot it out and, and forgive and forget. The Savior says, no matter what you've done, no matter how horrible your life may have been, you can be forgiven. I sat in a jail cell a few months ago with Jamie. Jamie had killed two people. Tears flowing down his face as he penitently said, Brother Paul, God can't forgive me, can he? There's just no way he can forgive me. But you know the answer. You know the reply that I was able to give. God wasn't happy with what he did. God was sorry that in his wickedness and evil and, and, and what he had done. But in the same way that Saul of Tarsus, breathing out slaughterings and threatenings against the church, capturing, putting in prison Christians, as well as killing or instrumentally in, in, in making that possible, and God chose him and used him. A servant, a chosen vessel. Paul was able then to say, I can do all things. I have faith and confidence. I know in whom I have believed. And I know that I fought and finished and kept. And henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 
verses 6, 7, and 8. The chorus, very simply, very beautifully, majestically, suggests come home. Come home, ye who are weary, come home. This old life, this struggle, this fight that we're in, it is wearisome. If we're militantly, aggressively fighting Satan, resisting Satan, 1 Peter 5, 8, James chapter 4, other places, picture before our minds a war that's raging and we're to fight the good fight and we're to war a good warfare and we're to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. We're going to get tired. Paul admonished the Galatian brethren, don't grow weary in well-doing for in due season you're going to receive that reward. In Hebrews chapter 12, after enumerating all the various ones who lived and served by faith, in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, remember, we look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who endured the cross, despised the shame. We keep our eyes on Him and we're renewed, we're strengthened, we're encouraged. When I realize what He was able to do, what He did for me, then whatever I'm called upon to do, no matter how tired physically I may be, how emotionally draining it may be, how difficult and, and at times troublesome Satan may make our life. When I keep my eyes on that glorious home, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with that which is to come. Romans 8. Home. To the soldier on a foreign soil who wants to be home. To the one that is traveling and has been away for several days. There's no more precious word than home. Of all the pictures that we have in the Bible of heaven, likely home stirs the emotion as much or more than any. When I read in concerning the mansion or the eternal home, the, the heavenly city, the place of paradise, the place of rest, the, the place where there's no, no pain, and the place where God will be with His people, to that spiritual person who has started his journey and is determined to press on toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Keeping our eyes focused, our minds and our heart are already there. We've set our affections on things above. Earnestly, tenderly, as it were, the nail-scarred hands outstretched, beckoning you, calling you. You see, when Maxie extends the invitation here or others that are preaching in this pulpit, it isn't to us that we're saying, come down to the front. Oh, we're just newspaper carriers. We're just servants. When we've done everything that we can possibly do, still unprofitable servants. But it's to Christ that we're beckoning you, we're pleading with you to come while yet there is time. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. The rich man, Luke's account of the gospel, he remembered. He remembered all the opportunities that he had to do good and obey God and follow God that he rejected. The rich man remembered the beggar that laid at his gate and how many times he had passed by him and just kind of kept on going. The rich man, no doubt, even remembered that he didn't really ask for much. He just asked for the crumbs that fell from the table. The rich man, after realizing the torment that he was in, he, he, he asked for water to be on the tip of a finger. He remembered a soothing, cooling effect. When that was rejected, he remembered five brothers who were lost and asked for someone to be sent back, but that wasn't possible either. The rich man remembered how much he had had 
on earth and that he had nothing at this moment in time. The rich man remembered likely over and over and over that he thought that he was doing what was best. Falsely. Wrongly. And now he knew that it was too late. Of all the images that we have of this song, I'd like to project before our mind's eye one final image. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Imagine, if you will, the prodigal son, his father. Oh, the prodigal son were quite well aware of what he did, how that he wanted what was due him, and he was, he was given that, and he was allowed to go and live in riotous living and spend it all, had friends while he had those, uh, all that money, and, and, and soon it was gone, his friend was gone, and he found himself in the hog pen. How much time passed during this time, I don't know. But I can only imagine by that which the Scripture records for us concerning the father who was watching and waiting saw him coming and ran to meet him and wasn't interested in hearing as it were the I'm sorry I've sinned I've messed up but he embraced him he was so happy that he was home dear friends it is as that father our heavenly father says, come, the mansion's prepared. You've got to do these things. But I'll give you eternal life. Become a child of mine. Live that fateful life for that brief time that you're upon this earth. And that eternal mansion, that heavenly home, will be yours throughout all eternity. The Father is watching, anticipating, wanting, extending beckoning you through His Word. Won't you, tonight if you're subject to His invitation, won't you come as we stand and sing?